I'm not dead. That sounds like something interesting. When so many things go wrong in a person's life, when they feel like they're drowning, that's when they need help. When you can't talk about why you're trapped, when you can't tell anybody why you feel invisible, that's a prison that's so difficult to break free of. You need a key. You need someone to listen. But most importantly, you need someone to take action. Sometimes we see what we want to see. And often that makes some people feel invisible. I matter to myself, and I don't know if I matter to anybody else. Well, I know I do, but I don't feel like I do. We're too busy. Look. What would it take to, to change that for you? It would take people believing in me. This is Anna Marie's story. But it's really much bigger than that. A lot of us can find bits and pieces of our lives woven in her words. Nobody knows what I go through. <laughs> Nobody knows what I've been through. Anna Marie will tell you what she can about her world. Me, I'm 16. Um, my life sucked so far, but I make the best of it. <laughs> her dad's in jail for 18 plus years. She doesn't say why. Oh, the reason is so important. But at 16, she can't go there yet. Well, I've been through a lot. And <laughs> I somehow stay on top of it. At her alternative high school in Coos Bay, she struggles to get back on track. Wasted time translates into hard work. Did you get your GED? No, I, I can, but I don't want to. I want to graduate. Why? Because I got told I wouldn't graduate, so. I'm gonna. <laughs> the Harding School is her constant. It's a refuge, a place that gives her something to hold on to. Do you dream? I gave up on dreaming a long time ago. <laughs> How did a 16-year-old girl become invisible? Life has not always been kind to Anna Marie, but again, that part of the story she'll hold on to for now. I've cut my wrist, not deep enough to do any damage, just deep enough to myself a little bit. <laughs> what were you looking for? I was looking for relief. Sometimes physical pain is easier to handle than the kind that haunts the mind. I hide behind my mask every day. <laughs> Just every time I smile, I'm hiding my face. So take off the mask for me. <laughs> I can't. Somebody drove down the road and even glanced at me. They'd see me, they wouldn't know nothing about me. And I want people, I want to know people. I want to want people to know me. I don't know. <laughs> they just see a girl with, that looks happy, but they, don't, they all, nobody knows how miserable I actually am inside. Anna Marie is on her own. I couldn't take it. I couldn't take being blamed of everything I wasn't doing because it just made me not want to succeed in nothing because they all accused me of being the bad child. And I was trying my best to be good. <laughs> she moved out, all the way out. And my mom asked me, or told me, she goes, I'll pay for you getting emancipated if you want to do it. And so I'm like, okay, and I did it. <laughs> so I have to work, I have to have a job. And yeah, I'm an adult compared to, uh, legally I can get in trouble for anything an adult can get in trouble for. Because sometimes I feel like there's nothing, or there's nothing, why did all this, why did I get emancipated, why did I, why do I work so hard, why, why can't I be a kid? <laughs> did you ever get to be a kid? Not really. <laughs>
And I wish, I wish most of all right now I could be, but I'm the furthest away from being a kid. I'm 16 and live a life of a 19 or 20 year old. Or a 40 year old. Yeah, I work 40 hours a week and go to school on top of that. School is important because without that, where am I supposed to make it? <laughs> her second chance. I sleep on a couch right now. <laughs> She's tired and stressed out and weary and... The and part's what gets me. Because if I was just working and going to school, I doubt I'd be as tired as I am. But having to stress over what I'm gonna eat for dinner, <laughs> what I'm supposed to, how I'm supposed to do laundry, how I'm supposed to have time to do laundry, <laughs> that gets to me a lot. <laughs> She's hoping to buy this old RV from her mom, set it up at a nearby park, and have her own place. I work at Burger King, and that's lots of fun. <laughs> I, I, I love work. I love being out of the house. I love being busy. I want a vacation away from everything, <laughs> away from everybody, away from myself, yes, and that's not going to happen, so. You crave change. You sense it doesn't have to be this way. But the falling, again, is more powerful than the desire for different. I'm always tired of mentally, tired of everything. But I don't know how I'd rather have it. So what really happened to Anna Marie? What happens to all the others? Nobody understands why I really left. I just think I rebelled and took off. <laughs> That's not how it was. If I would have stayed here, I don't think I would be here anymore. I don't think I could have made it. Hiding is never easy. Covering up takes great effort. Because I get so tired, I just like give up on everything. And I just have to go outside and I ball my eyeballs out for a good almost 10 minutes and then I'm good. I always tell everybody I'm fine. I may be out of my mind and so stressed out I can't handle much more, but I'm always fine. <laughs> I always put a smile on my face. It's like I hide behind my smile. I felt that way for a long time though, so. <laughs> what would happen if you didn't have that to hide behind? What would I see? <laughs> you would see somebody fall apart probably. <laughs> you really feel like that, don't you? Yes, I do. <laughs> Not much people know that. <laughs> Anna Marie wants to tell her whole story. She wishes it were possible. She knows that's what makes her invisible. But trust is like a step over the Grand Canyon. They need to understand that they can't give up on us. <laughs> they gotta help us as much as they can. They can't just like be mad at us and not want to help us. I know I'm tough. I pretend I'm tougher than what I am though. Because if you could sit down and really say what you feel, there's a seven-year-old girl in there screaming. In there. Yes. Just love me, care about me, touch me, talk to me, say that I matter, yeah. all that stuff. It's hard, isn't it? Yep. I get lonely a lot. Lonely for somebody to care. I think I ripped off being a kid, man. I seriously wish I could be a kid. That's what I miss the most right now. <laughs> I don't even have time to hang out with friends. I don't have time to do nothing. Invisible. It doesn't have to be this way. I wish people would open their eyes. Seriously, that's how come I'm here, because somebody opened their eyes and seen how I really was, seen who I was. You mean I could change somebody's life just by paying attention? Yes, of course you could. Seriously? Yes. <laughs> How does that work? You care a little bit. You, pay, you just pay attention to somebody. You get to know somebody. Why does that matter? Why does that matter? Because people matter. People's feelings matter. Here is your second chance. Take it and fly. So what can you do to help people become visible? 
Here's Grace Serbu's advice. She works with troubled kids. If you did look at them and smile at them, you have no idea what that means to that person. Rick, I have seen an incredible profound difference through mentoring. And what that is is human, human elements. Somebody who just is there taking you to coffee or helping you sit there with you. They need it so badly because they feel hopeless. They feel worthless in this community. Look me in the eye. Look me in the eye. Look me in the eye. Go back and forth. Yeah. Look me in the eye. Look in my ass. Look me in the eye. 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 Because people matter. Look me in the eye. Hannah, come on. My mom just called. I'm gonna stay with my friends. My mom's picking me up later. Fine. Who's that? Nothing. Is that him? It's nothing. You know it's kind of creepy that he's texting you yeah. over and over again. He knows it. He knows you're with us. Hannah, I'm really worried about you. I really think we should tell someone. Is it a phone or a leash? Hannah, I'm really worried about you. I'm Rick Dancer. On this episode of What's Happening Downtown, we're talking to J.D. Hauger with Gravity Lab. No plural, just a lab. That's tell right. me, uh -huh. tell me, J.D., you're working with the folks here at the uh, Hi-Fi Music Hall, right. uh, but you do a lot of different things. Ca talk about what you're doing in terms of streaming these bands here for, for the, the world, actually, out of Eugene, Oregon. Sure. Yeah, so I got, I got involved with these guys uh, real early on in their planning stage, and they always, uh, Mike and, and, and Danny, the, the, um, the owners, always had this vision of, of providing this platform for uh, video and, and I think it wasn't so much about the video as it was about putting the music out there, you know, and just making it available and accessible. It lined up well with my philosophy about um, information wanting to be free and, uh, and, and we had, you know, good working relationship together and, and so as just sort of baked into this this idea and this music hall was the uh, the concept that we were going to put these shows out there if the bands would allow it and and uh, so we have so when a band plays in Eugene now um, anybody in the world can see the concert free and live that, that's absolutely right what so, do you okay for your personality for your philosophy in life what do you like about that why is that the right thing to do well I think that the uh, the, the music industry has had sort of an iron grip control on on distribution and what I've always liked about the internet is it sort of it it levels the playing field so you don't have to be uh, right. cumulus broadcasting to to uh, be able to play you know whatever whatever music is popular you know that year you don't have to have you know a team of lawyers work out uh, uh, copyright issues um, I, I think that the bands want it to be out there I mean the bands want to be heard um, why why stand in the way of that do you find people are a little resistant though because it's it's new it's so um, I mean, you've been doing this a long time, but really for the culture, it's a, it's a little edgy and new for people. Yeah, I, I, I guess so. I think, I think what I'm seeing is that s some people uh, uh, think it's, it's, it's really new and, 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 and shiny and still flashy. Some people, you know, that, that maybe watch Live Nation or some of the other broadcasting, uh, uh, the, the people that are broadcasting out there, um, it's, it's sort of becoming par for the course. It's not expected, of course, from a music venue or, or a band to, to, to webcast it, but I think that uh, uh, even people that it's new to uh, uh, love the concept. So what do you think is going to happen? I, I'm, just, I'm interested because what do you think is going to happen in the future, next five years with the streaming industry, with what, what you're doing, that kind of thing for people out there who are watching going, who are still watching commercial television and thinking that they have to watch the commercials? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the, the millennials are going to shift that. I think they already are. Um, people are cutting cords and, and, and turning to the internet for, for content, still being monetized. 
I think what's going to happen is that this is going to uh, become uh, incredibly popular. And in five years, you're going to come back and be like, how did you know that that's what the people wanted? That's, that's how I feel about it. I think that um, uh, now that you can watch a live concert in the music hall, uh, on your phone, on the bus, on your way to class or work or, or, or wherever, I mean, you know, I mean, most of them are at night, but, but nevertheless, uh, it's, 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 people want the content and, and we're sending it out there, we're creating the content and, and making it. And you're giving the opportunity for people who are unknown but talented and yes. maybe don't have all the money and the extras and the PR people and all right. that to be able to just because they have good music or they write great lyrics, they become something that people can listen to. That's what I love about that. I agree, and that dovetails with uh, sort of uh, uh, leveling the playing field for everybody. Right. So where uh, tr talent can rise despite not having a marketing budget, you know. So. That's great, JD. Thank you so much for being here, and uh, they can just go online and find you on your website. Yeah, and then that's uh, gravlab.com, and it's G R A V is in Victor, L A B is in Boy.com, gravlab.com. All right, so we're going to open up a whole new world to you, okay. the world of streaming video. You're going to become a millennial whether you like it or not. Thanks. I tell people I have the best job in the world, you know, to, to hold a letter written by George Washington when he was president of the United States. I mean, how many Americans get to even just do that, you know, and to be the person who takes care of that material? You know, it's a fabulous job. It, it's like all stored away in our stacks, you know. Uh, yeah, just fabulous stuff. People could come in and use the Ken Kesey papers, the papers relating to um, Pacific Northwest literature, um, to learn about the migration of people from the Midwest to the West and the Oregon Territory in the 19th century in original Oregon Trail Diaries. I mean, people can come here and sit down and use these original documents, you know? It's like we've got this treasure trove of material. They don't really know that they have the right to come here to use these collections, you know? And you don't even have to be affiliate, affiliated with university. Anybody could come and use these collections in special collections in university archives, yeah. I had my first drink when I was seven years old and I sporadically used it until I was older and could get a constant supply. In 83, I stopped drinking and uh, for 17 years, but I really wasn't following through with a recovery program. I went back out for 14 years. I went from having a job, a home, and a family to being literally a indigent drunk on the streets. I didn't bathe. I didn't have a clean clothes. I only had one set of clothes. I didn't even brush my teeth for two weeks of my last drunk. And, uh, I ended up, by the grace of God, going through Lambert family, through their detox and also their in-house patient, and as a result of a lot of help from the counselors there, the staff there, uh, the nurse practitioner, and a therapist, I now stand here before you sober and happy. Hope, that's the big word for me. We hear that a lot, but I had no future. I mean, all I was laying there is I was drinking until I passed out. I was drinking for oblivion. I didn't want to come to again because all it was about was getting enough cans to, to base, buy some more alcohol for the day and what I got was hope and I mean there's a future. I have a future and it's unlit right now it seems my possibilities keep opening up wider and wider and my life has literally got better uh, since August 18th uh, of 2014. More things have happened to me, uh, good things. I'm. Uh, I'm a member of my community now. I do volunteer work in, at, in a place where I practice my faith. And it's hope is the big thing. And I've met a lot of people out there. Um, my observation of them, or I just connected with them because I felt the, uh, they felt the way I did. It's just like, we've given up. We have no hope. We're hopeless and just drink until, you know, there's just no hope for us. They may not verbalize it, but that's the way I was. I just, what's the point? There's, there's no hope for me, for the other people, yes, but not me. And I was resigned to drinking until they, you know, quite frankly, find my corpse someplace as an indigent drunk, probably buried in a potter's field or however they do it these days. My medical problems are a result 
of my primary problem, which is I'm an alcoholic. And that is, you know, it's, they, they say it's a disease, and looking at me, it was an obsession that when I started drinking, it overrode all thoughts to the contrary. Nothing about health was always about the next drink. And uh, pretty much I was committing suicide on the installment plan. I'm very grateful that I tend to own my own emotions and I'm not blaming other people like, oh, I'm in a bad mood so the world owes me something. It's like, well, hey, feelings come and go. I don't have to respond to this or live in it. They did not start there. I don't think, you know, they didn't, they weren't a kid saying, oh, gee, I can't wait, Mom, until I grow up and I become a street drunk and pushing a shopping cart around and digging through trash cans for cans so I can drink alcohol endlessly and then pass out and get up and do them the same thing next day. They come from a place, like all of us come from, come from families, maybe their families weren't the best, but, you know, they had hopes and dreams and aspirations. And somewhere along the line, the disease of alcoholism and drug addiction took over and all those things go away. Then it's just survival. Then it gets to, then it gets to I just can't stand living anymore and I, you know, please let this be the last time I drink and let me not come to. That was very much true for me. I was very disappointed when I would come through, come to from, from, from drinking. I just like, I, that was my only solution, oblivion. I mean, absolute non-existent. For me, it's shame. I wouldn't, uh, when I was out canning, I wore a hat, and I don't wear hats, and I'd look down, i look down at the street, I wouldn't look at cars going by, I wouldn't even look in a mirror. Uh, and I just didn't want to meet anybody's eyes because I felt they thought about me the way I felt about me, and I just did not like myself very much. Loathe is probably a more appropriate term. I didn't want to be this man, I couldn't stop being this man, and I felt helpless in my alcoholism and addiction. So I just kept drinking because that was, and it wasn't for an euphoric effect, it was just totally numb myself. Uh, on a cerebral and an emotional level, I just didn't want to feel anything. Feelings were not good for me. I didn't like them. To understand that the people there, they really don't want to be there, even if, and even if they militantly defend their right to be there, because I've done that, you know, I'm not hurting you, uh, they're trapped. And sometimes you just have to, say a prayer for them if that's your calling, and um, that it's a disease and it's no different than other diseases, unfortunately, socially it's very unattractive. And it's easy to look down on someone who doesn't have the right, you know, is dirty and smells bad. And sometimes they're unpleasant people to be around. I was. At that point, I didn't really feel I was worth anything. I really didn't feel like I measured up to, to you or anybody else out here. I felt very much ashamed of just my whole being. And they treated me like I had value and worth. And quite frankly, they kept treating me that way until I actually kind of started believing it myself, like, wow, maybe it's okay for me to be here. And that was, the, I know that sounds kind of strange, but that's true. And it's not uh, something that was bestowed on me. It was something that I developed and marinated, quite frankly, over the years. I didn't, I'm doing what I don't want to do. I'm harming people I loved. And I just keep drinking because I don't know what else to do. And after a while, you don't feel too good about yourself. I did not feel too good about myself. And they treated me like a human being. I mean, like, wow, it doesn't matter, you know, what you're wearing or, or where you're from. You're a genuine human being, and you have, or you have worth and value and things to offer the community. That's a big deal, when all, and all of a sudden, after a while, I mean, consistently treating me that way, um, you start saying, wow, I, I guess maybe that's true. That's just not something they say, you know, and it is, you know. I believe I'm becoming the man that I was originally created to be, and before, I basically was making, trying to make, I was destroying myself with chemicals. I actually believe now that I, I was, like everybody in this planet, we were born to be something, an original, and I was trying to be a copy, and it didn't work out too well.
Have you guys seen the new magazine out on the streets here in Lane County? I love this. It's Lane Monthly. It's in paper boxes and in just places all over where you find other newspapers. What I love about this is it's about the people and the places, events, and different products around the community that make this region such a great place to live. It's why we're all here. It's a lot like what Rick Dancer is trying to do on the TV show. But I love the feel of this and you look inside, there's gardening articles, different ways to celebrate Earth Day. And this is the last month issue. Just all kinds of a calendar of events. It is such a fun thing. And I love the way when you pick it up, it feels like kind of in between a magazine and a newspaper. You gotta check it out. It's locally produced, like locally published, and everything in here is local, Lane Monthly. You do not want to miss it if you want to know what's going on around town. In an era where newspapers are struggling and, and a lot of larger papers are dying, uh, we uh, are, are doing well because we tend to cover things local and we offer news that people can't get anywhere else. That, that's our model is covering local news and sports and anything to do with the community. Journalism and newspapers and uh, other media sources is important because uh, we have the training. Most of the people that I employ have gone to college and studied journalism and so what we offer is um, a source of news that can be trusted. Uh, you know, it, it's uh, in an era where everybody's trying to be the first to get the news out, uh, we actually do some research and talk to the sources and get the, get the story and all the details behind the story. What I will tell you, you know, about our food is that we prepare everything from scratch. So we make sure we hire people that have the passion for making food. That's one of the ingredients. The other one, we make sure that our recipes, they use the ingredients that we tell them to use. And we, before we uh, put it into the market, we make sure we test, you know, try it. What I love about this business is the people. I'm a people person, so I love to interact with people. They're, they're vital. If you don't have roads anywhere, you can only get there by air. In, a, in, a, in an inexpensive, uh, economical plane like this, it can get you there. and get anybody there. Well, each flight's always better than the next. I mean, uh, well, you'll see here real shortly, but uh, it's just spectacular. It's untouched and uh, it's rugged. Unbelievably rugged and uh, and beautiful all the same. Oh my gosh, look at the color of that water. Oh, 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 Ryan. I think we just landed in some place that nobody, nobody's ever been here before. No. One last thing I want to remind you about is Rick Dancer Media Services. We do a lot of things, everything from social media to videos for YouTube, videos for our show, videos for your website. We can produce a show from your location. Give us a call. We're really reasonable and we want to get the message out and help you. And so give me a call. My phone number is right there on the screen or go to my website, rickdancer.com or rickdancer.tv and let me know what we can do for you. And let's chat. Bigger than anything. It's, it is like the biggest thing ever, dude. Like I've never seen like a bigger state than Alaska in my whole life.